Welcome to the second video on momentum. In the first video, we talked about the idea of momentum, change in momentum, and impulse. In this video, we're now going to look at some of the math behind the momentum and impulse, and more specifically, the impulse momentum theorem. Before we move on, it's important to note a couple things that we're going to be dealing with when it comes to momentum. First of all, always establish a positive direction. When we start to look at velocity changes and what's happening to an object that's going through a momentum change, it's going to be important to know which direction you are establishing is positive. Now, it's important to know that you do have freedom. You can make any direction you want positive. Just be consistent. And then uh, uh, bullet two and three talk about how we are dealing with closed and isolated systems. What that means is any force or anything that is affecting the object is all going to be happening within a system. Basically what that means is it means that momentum is conserved. So that will be important to know because momentum is conserved, the same momentum you have at the beginning must be the same momentum you have at the end. With that being said, let's go ahead and move on to some practice problems. Let's take a look at this problem right here. You have a tennis ball that's being thrown at a brick wall. The initial velocity is 30 meters per second right before it hits the wall, and then right after it hits the wall, it has a velocity of 28 meters per second. So the initial stands for the velocity the moment before it hits the wall. The final represents the velocity of the moment after it hits the wall. The mass of this tennis ball is one kilogram. I would like to know what is the change in momentum and what is the impulse. All right, the first thing that we want to do is we want to establish a positive direction. Most of the time, if not all the time, I will make the positive direction to the right. Okay, and so that's important to remember. Now, now that we know that, let's go ahead and write out the information that we have. The information that we have is this. I know the mass is one kilogram. I know the initial velocity is 30 meters per second. And since the initial velocity is facing to the right, and I've made right the positive direction, it's a positive 30 meters per second. The final velocity is 28 meters per second, but notice the direction. The final velocity is in the opposite direction. It's facing to the left. And I've said right is positive. So that means the final velocity is actually negative 28 meters per second. This is probably one of the most commonly missed things um, in the momentum unit. So please make sure you pay attention to your direction. So now we have to solve for what is the change in momentum. Remember, mom change in momentum is mass times delta v. Now, my mass uh, is going to be one kilogram. And actually, before we do that, let's go ahead and rewrite this out. Mass, whenever we have a change in anything, delta anything, it's always the final minus the initial. So my mass is one kilogram. My final velocity is the negative 28 meters per second minus my initial velocity is positive 30 meters per second. So one kilogram times my change in velocity. My change in velocity is negative 58 meters per second. And so my change in momentum, or delta P, is going to be negative 58, and remember, it's kilograms meters per second. All right. The second question says, what is the impulse? Now, this is kind of a trick question, uh, because if you remember, the impulse momentum theorem stated this. Impulse, which is force times delta T, is equal to M times delta V. Well, we already solved for this. And since they're equal to each other, impulse is always equal to the change in momentum. So if my change in momentum is the negative 58, my impulse is also going to be negative 58. Now, the only thing is to be aware of is this. Look at the units of what impulse would be. Force is in the units of newtons. Time is in the units of seconds. So impulse actually has the units of newton seconds. Now, a lot of times right here, students get really confused on something that's not meant to be confusing. They look at this and they say, wait, if they're equal to each other, why do they have different units? They really don't have different units. If you think about it, what is a newton? Do you remember? A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. 
if you take that and multiply it by a second, which is your time, this second goes away and you're reduced to only one second being in the denominator. And look at that. You're, you're left in units of kilogram meter per second. So it really is the same thing. I guess it's just a convention thing. Physicists have always used the units of kilogram meter per second when they're talking about momentum. And they've always used the units of Newton seconds when they're talking about impulse. But I do want you to see they really truly are the same unit. But make sure from here on out, whether it's a worksheet, a quiz, or a test, please use the units of kilogram meter per second if you're talking about momentum and use the units of Newton seconds if you're talking about impulse. All right, now there's a second question I'd like to ask here. What is the average force acting on the ball if it is in contact with the wall for 2.3 times 10 to the negative third seconds? So that's not a lot of time. So it's asking for what is the average force, which is F, if it's in contact with the wall for 2.3 times 10 to the negative third seconds. So that's our time or our change in time. So think about it. We know what the impulse is. Our impulse is negative 58 Newton seconds. That's equal to force times delta t, which our delta t is 2.3 times 10 to the negative third seconds. If we divide both sides by 2.3 times 10 to the negative third, we will end up getting our force. And our, if we do that, our force is going to be approximately negative 25,217 newtons. Because notice the seconds canceled out, so I'm left in newtons, which is my unit of force. Now that's a lot of force. Luckily, that's not acting on, your, on the ball for a long period of time. But that is a lot of force that's acting on the ball. Now, a lot of times, students will not understand why the negative is there. The negative needs to be there in the answer. That's important. If we go back to the positive direction that I made, I made to the right positive. If my force is negative, that means the force must be acting this way. And if you think about it, that makes sense. The wall has to be pushing to the left to make the tennis ball go to the left after it's made the collision. So the key thing I want you to see from this slide is not only the math, but the sign is very important. All right, we're going to look at some more problems here um, in just a moment. But before we do that, I do want to talk about impulse because impulse is really, really, really important. Remember, impulse is just force times time. Now, force and time have an inverse relationship with each other. In other words, if your force is small, your time is big. And if your force is big, your time is small. So I want you to think about an example. Okay? Let's say you were doing a water balloon toss. Okay? And this, this guy up here, he's really in the zone. Okay? He's getting really into it. Now, when you do a water balloon toss, how do you catch the water balloon? Do you usually just catch it with your hands stationary? No, that's going to pop the balloon. Okay? What you want to do is you want to actually catch the balloon kind of while, while absorbing the, the, the balloon a little bit. You, you, you go down with the balloon and you catch the balloon uh, by expanding the time out. When you fall with the balloon as you're catching it, basically what you're doing is you're expanding the time that the balloon is in contact with your hands. And so when you have a lot of time, that means the force that's going to act on the balloon is going to be very small. But on the flip side of that, if the amount of time that you're using to catch the balloon is very small, meaning you're just trying to catch it and not going with it, well, then that means your force is going to be very big. And that's actually what pops the balloon. So impulse and your relationship between force and time is actually very applicable to a lot of life things. If you remember the baseball uh, example in the previous video, we talked about how they pad the baseball field with padding. And it might not seem like a lot, but that padding actually increases the time, allowing you to have less force acting on your body. Now, let's look at an example. Okay? Let's say it takes an impulse of 500 Newton seconds to stop an object. Okay? List five ways that this could be accomplished. Okay, so our impulse, which is J, is 500 Newton seconds. 
What are five different ways you can accomplish this impulse? Well, you could apply a force of 500 newtons over a time of one second. You could apply a force of 250 newtons over a time of two seconds. You could apply a force of five newtons over a time of 100 seconds. You could apply a force of 100 newtons over five seconds. Or you could apply a force of, let's say, 50 newtons over a time of 10 seconds. Obviously, that is not an exhaustive list. You can do several other examples. But you get the idea. Impulse is just a product of force over time. The higher the amount of time, the less force that actually needs to be acting on an object. So right here it says, this is a conceptual problem. In terms of impulse, what is the purpose of airbags and dashboards? Both airbags and dashboards are designed to increase the amount of time your body is in collision with the car. Now you may be thinking, okay, airbags, I get that, but dashboards, really? Yeah, dashboards are actually made with a very compressible uh, plastic when you're in a crash. Okay, a polymer or some sort of material that's designed to compress. So when you, if, if you happen to get into a crash, which we obviously want to avoid, but if you do, the airbag and the dashboards allow more time for your body to absorb the force. So because there's more time, less force is actually acting on your body. Okay. Let's look at some examples here of uh, this, this impulse momentum theorem. All right, this one right here. A soccer player kicks a 0.1 kilogram ball that is initially at rest so that it moves with a velocity of 20 meters per second. What is the impulse the player imparts to the ball? If the player's foot was in contact with the ball for 0.01 seconds, what was the force exerted by the player's foot on the ball? Okay, so a soccer player kicks a 0.1 kilogram ball. So let's go ahead and write that down. Mass is equal to 0.1 kilograms. It's initially at rest, so its initial velocity is zero. Afterwards, the ball is moving with a velocity of 20 meters per second. What is the impulse that the player imparts on the ball? Now, you may be thinking to yourself, wait, how can I possibly calculate impulse if I'm not, giving, if I'm not given force or time? Well, remember, Impulse is the same thing as mass times delta V. So simply by taking mass times delta V, you are actually calculating impulse as well. They're one and the same thing. So let's do that. Let's do mass, which is 0.1 kilograms, times my change in velocity. My final velocity is 20 meters per second, and my initial velocity is zero. Notice that I, I didn't really make a huge deal about establishing a positive direction in this one, because I kind of did it in my head. I figured if the initial velocity is zero, I'm just going to make the final velocity the positive direction. All right, so if we do that, we end up getting 0 0.1 times 20, and therefore my change in momentum is equal to 2 kilograms meters per second. And change in momentum is the same thing as impulse. So when the question says, what is the player's impulse, what is the impulse the player imparts on the ball, the answer is also 2. However, since it's asking for impulse, I'm going to put the units of Newton seconds. Remember, it's the exact same unit, but we want to make sure that we are consistent. If you're solving for impulse, put Newton seconds. Okay, let's look at another example. And I need to extend the page here so it actually can fit on there. There we go. Okay, a driver accelerates a 240 kilogram snowmobile which results in a force being exerted that speeds up, speeds up the snowmobile from 6 meters per second to 28 meters per second over a time interval of 60 seconds. What is the snowmobile's change in momentum? What is the impulse on the snowmobile? What is the magnitude of the average force that is exerted on the snowmobile during this time? Okay, so we have a driver that's accelerating a 240 kilogram snowmobile. So the math is 240 kilograms. As the driver accelerates, the driver accelerates uh, the snowmobile going from 6 meters per second. So my initial velocity is 6. And I'm going to make that the positive direction. And the final velocity would be positive 28 meters per second. Still positive because the snowmobile is still going in the same direction. I'm told the time interval that that happens 
is 60 seconds. What is the snowmobile's change in momentum? Okay, change in momentum is mass, which is 240 kilograms, times delta V. Delta V is V final, which is 28, minus V initial, which is 6. To figure out that, we just take 240 times 28 minus 6, and we end up getting the change in momentum is 5,280 kilograms meters per second. All right, the second question says, what is the impulse? Remember, impulse is equal to change in momentum. So my impulse is also 5,280, but I'm going to put the unit of Newton seconds. Why? Because we're solving for impulse. What is the magnitude of the average force acting on the snowmobile that's exerted during this time? So remember, our force is going to come from our impulse. Impulse is equal to force times change in time. I know the impulse is 5,280 newton seconds. That's equal to the force, which is what we're going to solve for, times delta t, which is the 60 seconds. And therefore, my force is going to equal 88 newtons. So the average force that was exerted on the snowmobile during acceleration was 88 newtons. Now, I just remembered that I did not finish the problem previously. So I'm sorry about that. So let's go back. Uh, if we remember the soccer player problem, we figured out that the impulse acting on the soccer ball was 2 newton seconds. And then the question said, if the uh, player's foot was in contact with the ball for 0 0.01 seconds, what was the force exerted? So same thing here. My impulse is equal to force times delta t. That's impulse. We solved for the impulse. It was 2 newton seconds. And so that's going to be equal to force, which is what we're solving for, times the change in time which is 0 0.01 seconds. And so force is going to end up being 200 newtons. Okay, now we can also figure out impulse looking at it graphically as well, and this is important. Okay. What is the impulse delivered by the force in the graph shown during the first five seconds? So hopefully by this point in physics, you're starting to figure out that when we look at graphs, there's two different things that we can look at. We can look at slope to tell us information, or we can look at area. The question is asking for what is the impulse? And remember, impulse is force times delta t, or in other words, it's going to have the units of newton seconds. So if I look at this graph and I found the slope of the graph, the slope of the graph will give me rise over run, or in other words, will give me the units of newtons over seconds. Newtons over seconds isn't anything. So the slope isn't going to tell me the impulse. Instead, if I took the area underneath the graph, okay, so for the first five seconds, take the area underneath this curve, that would give me the units of newton seconds. So let's do that. If you know the area of a trapezoid, you can certainly use that. But in case we don't, let's just split this shape up into two simpler shapes. Let's put a line right here down to four seconds. And so now we have a triangle. And then we also have a rectangle. We're going to find the area of those two shapes. And then we're just going to add them together. So let's do the triangle first. The triangle has an area of one half base times height. Or in other words, it's one half time times force. So the area of this triangle right here is one half. The base is four seconds. And the height is going to be four newtons. If we look at that, four times four is 16 divided by two. That's going to give me eight newton seconds. Now that's just for the first part. We need to also take the area for the rectangle. The area for the rectangle is a lot easier area for here is just going to be base times height, or in other words, time times force. So the area for this rectangle right here is the base, which from here to here is only one second, times the height, and the height of that rectangle is four newtons. So the impulse for that portion of time is four newton seconds. 
and then we just add them together, and we end up getting the total impulse acting on the object during that time is 12 newton seconds. All right, I would go ahead, try to pause this video, and then go ahead and work on this one on your own. Then when you are ready, go ahead and click play to reveal the answer. Okay, let's see how you did. The toughest part, I think, about this problem is honestly the sketching of the graph. Once you have a graph, the problem is pretty self-explanatory based on the last example. So we see that an object is initially at rest, and it's experiencing a force on it such that the force is 15 newtons larger every second. So you can see, for the first five seconds, after each second, the force is up by 15. So at one second, the force is 15. At two seconds, the force is 30, and so on, all the way up to five seconds. Now at five seconds, the force stops increasing and remains constant for two seconds. So you can see that it's a flat line at 75, continuing that constant 75 newtons for the last two seconds. Once you have the graph sketched, now you can answer problem two and three. Number two asks, what is the impulse acting on the object during the entire time interval? From the last slide that we saw, we can see that we can calculate impulse simply by taking the area under the curve. Once again, we have a trapezoid, so I've split it into a triangle represented in green and a rectangle represented in black. By taking the area of the triangle plus the area of the rectangle, we end up getting 337.5 newton seconds is the, ch is the impulse. When it asks for what's the change in momentum, notice it's the exact same numerical value, 337.5, but I simply changed the units because we're talking about momentum. So the momentum of the object has changed by a, po excuse me, by a positive 337.5 kilogram meter per second. Finally, question three states, if the object has a mass of 30 kilograms, what is its speed at seven seconds? Okay, so at seven seconds, it would have experienced a change in momentum of 337.5 kilogram meters per second. So what I do is I set that equal to my change of momentum formula. Change in momentum equals mass times change in velocity. If I know my change in momentum is 337.5 and my mass is 30, my delta V is, end up going, is going to be my final velocity since I started at zero. And so my final velocity would be 11.25 meters per second. This concludes the second video on the math of change in momentum and impulse.